I'll just talk about the um, um, how we were voting. Hello everyone and welcome to uh, AFI Education. Our first one for the year, just to remind you all that we're recording this. We're going to put it on our YouTube site, so uh, be aware of that. Ask questions. I'll let uh, Steve do the introductions and thank you Ross for coming on down. Let's go. Good evening all and thank you. What is that? Is that a person who's been doing fire investigation for 30 years and therefore calls himself a fire, him or herself a fire investigator? Or is there other some particular stand uh, boxes to tick to make sure that you are what you say you are? That, that's pretty much uh, It's an ongoing, uh, I think in Australia. I think in Australia we don't quite. Okay, sorry. So I think in Australia uh, we don't quite have that uh, recognition in courts just yet. I, th I believe it's very big in the United States and other parts of the world and Ross will let us know about that. Um, the more uh, you get yourself involved in professional development nights like this, associations like the AFI, doing conferences, doing workshops uh, and um, accessing peer-reviewed documents like NFPA 921, the more professional your, your uh, work will be. So uh, it seems a bit of a uh, understatement to have to introduce Ross at all, but you're, I'm sure you know Ross Brogan uh, through the many years that he's been associated with the AFI and the IAAI. He, um, he kindly accepted an invitation to uh, speak tonight on those two documents. Uh, I knew, it, I knew in the, by sending an invitation I'd be getting the, the, probably the best in the field for the, in this particular area as well as others. Just a, just a quick just a quick overview. I, I think you most, mostly know him, but he spent many years in the New South, when it was the New South Wales Fire Brigade. He rose to the rank of inspector. He uh, he was in the fire investigation department for many years. Um, he 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 would you say won? Is that the word? Award, awarded the AFSM. And since he, in his uh, sort of semi-retirement years, he's been involved with Charles Sturt University as a lecturer, and he marks uh, as an adjunct lecturer. Adjunct lecturer, marking um, marking essays for that for the courses in fire investigation. So he's still very much involved. I don't think he'll ever possibly be able to fully retire. There's too much in his blood. So Ross, thank you very much for agreeing to attend tonight. And by the way, just come back from a cruise. So it's like, you know, for something. Back in the life, yeah. yeah, back in the life and back in front of us. So we're very grateful to have him here in front of us. Please make him welcome. Thanks, Steve. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, as part of um, the IAAI, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of a committee called FISC, the Fire Investigator Standards Committee. And that committee um, has the role of making members of the IAAI uh, aware of different things like NFPA 921 and 1033 and what that means for members and how members should use those documents. Uh, and the IAAI is not just America. As you know, you know it's throughout Australia and New Zealand. Um, there's about 80 chapters, I think, right throughout the world, including you know, France and Israel, uh, Belgium, Holland, um, England. So there are a lot of people uh, that get involved with this, and I'll go into that a little bit deeper. Uh, with this discussion and just to make you aware NFPA in the National Fire Protection Association is an American organisation but it's a non-profit organisation and its, um, its standards and codes and um, guides are well known and well regarded throughout the world. Uh, in fact a few years ago I was doing an investigation that involved uh, standards and 
uh, and codes. And I spoke to a fellow who was the president of a national uh, association, Na National LP Gas Association of Australia, and I asked him if he was aware of NFPA standards and codes. And he said, yes, a lot of our members use those codes and standards, but they also use Australian New Zealand codes and standards because they're a little bit more rigorous and they suit people far better in Australia than the NFPA standards. So the NFPA has been going since 1896 um, and it has over 200 technical codes and standards covering all different uh, walks of life like fire, uh, electricity, gas uh, and all different, different types of uh, codes that are required. And the NFPA codes and standards are recognised worldwide as industry best practice. And these codes and standards aren't just, aren't just set by a committee. And if you look in the, in the front of, of these documents, it shows you who the committee members are and what their affiliation is um, and whereabouts in that committee they stand. But it also accepts uh, comments, written comments, from the public about different parts of those codes and standards and the guides and it asks for those comments so they can be developed further. Uh, they discuss them in meetings that they have, in regular meetings and this is all done over uh, somewhere between three and five years. So each of these standards and codes and guides is renewed every three to five years. Currently, we're looking at 2014 versions of 1033 and 921. Um, the next version of 921, uh, and I only got a, an email from the head of uh, the FISC committee today, um, NFPA 921, the new one will come out in 2017. So at the moment, they're accepting comments through the NFPA website, uh, nfpa.org and you can go into those sites and if you think that there's something in one of these documents that needs changing, um, then you can write in a submission and it will be put before the committee uh, and they will discuss it. Uh, sometimes they say, no, that's no good, uh, and sometimes they say yes. It just depends on the discussion and what they feel like. It's not just American. Um, they are in America but there are other people on, the, on these committees from other different countries as well, um, and so they discuss them as a worldwide prospect. Uh, and each, so that way each document becomes fluid and dynamic, it's forever changing, um, and when you read through the document, you will see there's a black line beside some chapters, some uh, sections. That means that's a new section that's been put in in this edition, from, from the last edition. And one of the things that I always insist on with my students um, and I advise other people, use the most up-to-date literature that you can get your hands on. There's no good using the 2011 edition of NFPA 921 because if you go to court and you end up in the witness box, sure enough, the barrister or someone else is going to come up with 2014 and something will be different and you'll look like a fool and you don't want that when you're in court. You don't want that any time. Uh, NFPA 1033 is the standard for professional qualifications for a fire investigator. As I said, 2014 edition. And it facilitates safe, accurate investigations by specifying the job performance requirements, JPRs, necessary to perform as a fire investigator in both public and private. That's in the RFS in the New South Wales Fire Brigade or Fire Rescue New South Wales with an insurance company, with the police, with anyone. These should be applicable. Now, once you go outside New South Wales, you will find there are differences in the different states. And if you go into court and you try to talk to them about this is the way it should be done under NFPA 1033, most of the time they haven't got a clue what you're talking about. So we need to make, it more, make people more aware of this, we need to use it more so that we're seen as professional fire investigators. One of the, one of the uh, court cases I was involved in recently in Victoria 
uh, the investigator for the police. The forensic investigator had no formal qualifications whatsoever and actually stated in the witness box that he'd never heard of 1033 or 921 and it was just some American junk. Um, I had a hell of a time trying to convince them what this was, giving, giving the barrister I was appearing for uh, lots and lots of documents uh, to try and you know, make, it, make it a higher profile. Um, and you'll find that when you go to court, even in New South Wales, you will find similar sort of things, but you need to promote 921 and 1033 so that we are all seen as, as professional investigators. Just on the example, Ross, so when you said that, or he said that, how did the court take that? I mean, we we're all here to try and incorporate 921 and 1033, but in the court, in any court in Australia, that seems to be acceptable. He said, I've never heard of it. I've been doing this job for yeah. years. Here's my what, evidence. What you get is that, um, and this happened in a court in um, Northern Territory as well, um, I, I said to my barrister, I was acting for the defence, um, that what he was saying wasn't up to speed with 1033. Uh, he wasn't a qualified or professional fire investigator because he didn't follow these JPRs of 1033 uh, and that sort of thing. And my barrister put it to the judge and the, the judge said, I will listen to what he's got to say. I will listen to what Mr Brogan's got to say and I will make up my mind between the two of them who has the best argument. So it's just a matter of using these things to the best of your ability and showing them that you are actually a professional and you're following all the rules and regulations. Um, currently there's no standard in Australia or the Southern Hemisphere or anywhere else in the world which offers professional qualifications for fire investigators. This is the only document. Now for someone, someone to say it's only American and it's junk, then they really don't know what they're talking about and we have to make sure that we're going to convince someone that it is. 921 is a guide for fire and explosion investigation. Not 1033 is a standard and 921 is a guide. There is a difference. And 921 sets the bar for scientific based investigation because we're all scientific based as an investigator. We use scientific information and scientific knowledge to do what we do. And it's referenced in the field, in training and in court and it's the foremost guide for rendering accurate opinions as to incident origin, cause and responsibility. Now the handout that I've given has got some links that you can use for these documents. There's one here, if you haven't got one, there's some down, down there. The National Law Review. It's headed, The Bible for Fire and Explosion Investigation, and it talks all about 921. And that's a, that's a pretty substantial document. The NFPA Journal has, has an article uh, guided by science and it's all about how relevant 921 is and how it is uh, an industry standard. So a standard is a document that the main text of which contains only mandatory provisions using the word shall to indicate requirements and which is in a form generally suitable for mandatory reference or for adoption into law. And a guide is a document that's advisory or informative in nature. So a standard infers that you should use it, you shall do this and you shall do that. A guide is something that you should follow this, but you don't have to if you've got a better, better way. NFPA 1033 at present is only published in English but they're investigating publishing it in Spanish for, for the majority of uh, America uh, where a lot of Spanish is spoken. And the standard identifies the minimum job performance requirements, the minimum. And the purpose of the standard shall be to specify the minimum job performance requirements for serving as a fire investigator 
public and private. So it's for everyone. And it's not the intent of this standard to restrict it so that any authority such as the Rural Fire Service or Fire Rescue New South Wales ex can exceed the, the minimum. They can exceed the minimum, they can put on further requirements, but they shouldn't go below the minimum. And as far as teaching goes, there is a section in 1033 which allows teachers and educators to change things around so that it, it makes it easy to teach these instead of, because most of the JPRs are things that you actually have to be observed to be done. You have to actually carry out some of these things in front of a, an examiner. But there is a section in there which allows educators and teachers such as myself to put all of that language into some sort of language that allows us to put it to you in a written form and for you to do it as a written assessment to come back and there's no practical work involved. It also allows us to put in uh, local, state or federal uh, requirements such as some um, safety requirements or there might be a particular uh, protocol that is used by your service and we can put that in there uh, and that's allowed by 1033 to go outside those JPRs but it also allows us to teach those JPRs to reach the same uh, aim and objective at the end. Told you I'd make you famous Steve. It's just one of the classes. We used to run a, a one week um, face to face course um, but for the last couple of years we haven't had uh, enough students who have been uh, requesting that. <coughs> now NFPA 1033 uh, 1 1.3.7 says the investigator shall have and maintain. So you should reach this level and you should maintain at least this level at a minimum and have basic knowledge of all of these things. Fire science, fire chemistry, thermodynamics, thermometry, uh, I won't read them all out, you can see them for yourself there. All of those different things we use when we do an investigation. You may not realise it, but you do. And in the last couple of years, uh, with the 2014 edition of 921, some of those uh, have been added in into that list. Some of those weren't there prior. Uh, things like thermodynamics and thermometry, um, and I've had to add those into our curriculum for Charles Sturt University courses, but it, you know, it sounds very uh, high class. Thermometry is just knowing all about temperatures. That's all it is, really. Um, it sounds, sounds like it might be complicated and difficult. Um, explosion dynamics, you know, which window blew out? Will the wall blow out first before the windows do? Will the doors blow off? And uh, where did the forces go? And those sort of things. Um, most of these things here um, are available as teaching modules on cfitrainer.net. And cfitrainer.net is a free w uh, site. And you can go on there, you log on, all you do is put in your, your email address or a username and you pick a password and you go on there and you can do all of these modules. There's something like 40 odd modules about different things at the moment. And at the end of that module, some of them take two to three hours, but they give you all of the information you require. When you get to the end, you can elect to take a small test. And if you're successful at that test, it allows you to print off a certificate to say you were successful. And with our uh, Charles Sturt courses, in most of them, I require the student to do some of these different modules that relate to those subjects and send me a copy by email um, of that certificate to say you were successful. It, it stops me from getting too involved in some of those things, but it allows me to see that the student has learnt this sort of material because he's passed the test. So it's a very good resource, cfitrainer.net, cfitrainer, all one word, .net. And, and as I said, it's free. Um, it's a collaborative project between the United States Fire Administration 
and the IAAI um, and the United States Fire Administration uh, put up the funding for it and one of their uh, provisos was that no one had to be a member of any organisation that anyone in the public could go ahead and do them. So you don't have to be a member of the IAAI, uh, you don't have to be a member of anything, you can just get on to that website and do those modules for your own education. <coughs> and one of the other provisos is the fire investigator shall remain current in the topics listed in 1.3.7 by attending formal education courses, workshops and seminars or through public, uh, professional publications and journals. Now that's one of, the, one of the big things when you go into a court and someone comes along in opposition to you and says, well, um, I did, uh, this happened to me, I did, a, I did an internal course eight years ago, I haven't done any revision, I don't belong to an organisation, I don't read manuals or journals, and I've never done any fire testing. They sort of sink themselves when they do that sort of thing. But it says in there that you must maintain all of this by going to professional organisations such as what we're doing here tonight. And the other thing is the fire investigator shall employ all elements of the scientific method. Just yesterday I received an email from the UK from the Fire Investigators Association and they've published a code of practice for investigators of fires and explosions for the criminal justice system in the UK. That's coming out in April and it's been sent out to members of the UK Association uh, for their information. It's a collaboration between the Chief Fire Officers Association, the Institution of Fire Engineers and the IAAI chapter throughout the UK. And within that document, they also mention that, that the scientific method must be used. And the fire investigator shall maintain necessary liaison with other interested professionals and entities and therefore the IAAI, NAFI, National Association of Fire Investigators, New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, uh, Fire Investigators Association New Zealand and the Australian New Zealand Forensic Science Society are all different organisations where you can do all of that and comply with those JPRs. Safety is a big thing. Um, because fire investigators are required to perform activities in adverse conditions, um, a lot of emphasis throughout these documents is placed on safety. Um, and that's one of the things that with the teaching objectives, as I spoke about before, we can put those sort of things in uh, and insist that you uh, follow either state or agency safety requirements, safety protocols, because our teaching goes all over the world. We can't just say you need to follow New South Wales Occupational Health and Safety. The emphasis is you follow your agency's occupational health and safety requirements or your state government or your federal government. Um, that's just an example of whether someone's following safety guidelines or not. And the fire investigator shall adhere to all applicable legal and regulatory requirements. So things like if you're not authorised to collect physical evidence, then don't do it because you will get into trouble. And the next section, 4.1.1, goes through all these different areas, the scene examination, documenting the scene, evidence collection and preservation, interviewing, post-incident investigation, and presentations. And presentations is whether you're presenting your findings and your evidence to your boss, to your workmates, to an arbitrator or to a jury or a magistrate or a judge. That covers all of that sort of thing. And fire investigations are carried out all over the world and in all different situations. And the fellow on the right is going to be the new superintendent, Fire Rescue New South Wales, Greg Rankin. Don't know who the fellow on the left is. Uh, each section of the job performance requirements not only talks about you having the requisite knowledge, and the requisite knowledge comes from 921. 
and other documents, but a majority of that comes from 921. But the requisite skills as well to perform these tasks. 921 uh, is a guide, as I said before. Um, I've showed you the National Law Review and the journal. It's regarded as a premier source for fire investigations. And 921 is now translated and published in English, Spanish, Korean, French, Hebrew, Mandarin and Chinese, which makes it a truly world-recognised document worthy of praise. Chapter 4 talks about the basic methodology, which is the scientific method. It's a complex endeavour involving skill, technology, knowledge and science. All of those things. And we use those things every time we do an investigation. We might not know it, but we do. And the compilation of factual data as well as analysis of those facts. And the systematic approach recommended is that of the scientific method, which is used in the physical science. We're not the only ones that use the scientific method. All different branches of scientists use the scientific method. They don't look at the similar, same evidence that we do, and they probably don't look at it the same way as we do, but they use the same method, the scientific method. And when you're planning your investigation, the scientific method should be used. To start with, we recognise the need. It's been a house fire, and it needs to be investigated to either catch a culprit or to stop it happening again, to try and prevent it. Define the problem. There's a fire in a bedroom, someone was injured, we need to find out how that fire started, where it started and why that person was injured. Collect data and analyse data are exactly the same things and can be carried out at the same time. When you're collecting data, whether you're just walking around the room and looking at burn patterns looking at fire damage or looking at actual evidence that might be on the ground, you're analysing it as you go. Is that worth me looking at it? Is it worth me photographing it? Is it worth me having that collected? You analyse it as you go. You might not think you do, but you do as you go. And then from collecting and analysing that data, we're developing a hypothesis. Where did this fire start? How did it start? I might have a couple of hypotheses. But then we go along and we test it. And we test it against the evidence that we have and against the scientific facts and what science says can happen and can't happen until we select the final hypothesis. And the final hypothesis is what we go to our final finding with and say, OK, fire started over there and this is how I think it started from my testing of the hypotheses that I had. So by using that scientific method, you can justify what you've been doing so that when you get to your conclusion, you've justified everything to the end and you can justify what your finding is. And the other content of 921 uh, is planning the investigation, safety for you and others, uh, maybe mitigation, maybe prevention, Sometimes you might just say, no, it's unsafe and I'm not going to go in. Every now and again you'll get something like that. It's, it's your health and your safety uh, and maybe others. If you don't consider that it's safe enough for you to go in, then don't go in. If you can justify why. Say, oh, well, the roof's in a precarious position or there's holes in the floor. Um, I had one uh, in a three-storey uh, apartment in uh, the eastern suburbs. And when I got there, one of the firefighters came to me and said, I stepped into the, the fire floor, the third floor. When I stepped in, my foot went through the, roof, uh, through the floor and the officer standing next to him said, yeah, and his foot hit me in the head because I was underneath it. It was just too safe. When I looked at it, looked around, there was no way that I could do anything to make it safe for me to go in. So I did the best I could. I photographed, I looked from the doorway um, and... I gave my opinion uh, as much as it was because you will always find that someone else who was investigating, whether it be police, uh, private investigators, will have other information and all of that might go together um, to complete the jigsaw. But if it's unsafe 
and you consider you shouldn't go in, then don't go in, don't risk your life. Um, basic fire science, fire chemistry, heat transfer, fluid, blah, blah, blah. Fire patterns and analysis, physical evidence, it's, it's always important that you know what physical evidence is and how important it can be. You don't necessarily have to collect it. If you're not authorised to collect it, as I said, don't touch it. But you should know because someone might come along who isn't aware of the importance of that bit of, bit of evidence. And you can make them aware of it and say, I think that's important, it needs collecting. If they don't, that's up to them. But you've made them aware of it. So it's important to be aware of what is evidence and how valuable that evidence may be to, to the overall picture that you're looking at. Uh, origin determination, as I said, analysis and developing hypotheses and fire cause determination. All of these are covered in 921 in quite some depth. And if you look at burn patterns, you can, uh, they can tell you they can tell you a lot of things, uh, a V pattern or a cone pattern, inverted V pattern. It hasn't reached the ceiling, so it wasn't real intense. Not as intense as this one because it's developed a pattern right up onto the ceiling. And by looking at different burn patterns, we can work out uh, where the fire may have started, what may have been involved. So it's important to uh, make sure you're looking at these if you think they're important uh, and they're an important piece of evidence, then you need to record them and document them. More burn patterns. Uh, we can tell here that the fire has been more intense at this end because there's far more damage to the window frame here than here and down here. We've still got the aluminium frame intact where there's no aluminium frame left in there. We've got burn pattern coming out there, up that way, up that way, there, severe damage to the guttering and the barge board. We've got burn pattern and V pattern smoke exit coming out windows. We've got radiation heat on the grass out here. All valuable information, all valuable evidence that needs to be documented. Documenting the scene by notes, photographs, diagrams or floor, pa floor plans and final reports. Covers building systems, electricity and gas. Uh, a lot of the electricity uh, in 921 is, um, to, is, detail, is dealing with American systems, with 110 volt systems. Um, but you sh you'd be able to realise uh, that it is dealing with American um, but it does have a lot of further information about electricity uh, itself and gas systems and you just need to apply that uh, to your own area. Uh, appliances, failure analysis, incendiary fires, human behaviour and legal considerations. Some of the legal considerations are mainly American um, so again you need to take into consideration your own legal requirements. Burn patterns again, um, this is like a washing machine, they're used in hospitals for uh, washing and sterilising urine bottles and bedpans. And we had a spate of fires involving several hospitals and when we turn this one upside down uh, you can see this is the water pump and that's the delivery hose that goes to the, to the machine itself and this is the electrical box where the 240 volt comes in. Now you can, this is upside down, we're looking at the underneath of it. Right along here it's all rusted and all of that white material is um, uh, like soap residue. So there's been a leak in here, it's been leaking for quite some time and when we did some research on it we found that uh, this type of machine was something new and it had a ceramic disc as a seal in it and the life, lifespan of that ceramic disc was about five years and all these fires started at around about five years. So there was a water leak here, it impacted on the 240 volt uh, incoming supply and we had lots and lots of fires and what they did, um, we had a, 
a uh, notice put out through all, it was all private hospitals, they weren't used in public hospitals. These were in public hospitals, so the health department had a notice put out through all of the public, all the private hospitals, um, telling them to either get rid of these and replace them with something new, or to uh, reduce the water pressure in them. We weren't real happy with that, but that was their solution and we had to live with it. Uh, death and injuries from fire. Um, this poor woman didn't die from the fire. Well, she did from the fire. It was smoke inhalation. She had a little uh, 240 volt fan heater beside the bed and when she went to sleep, she dropped a bit of clothing over the top of it. Uh, the air intake uh, was, was reduced. The thing overheated and it caught fire because it was all plastic and it produced so much smoke. She's on the third level of this apartment and the carpet right down at floor at the ground level near the front door was black like that so you couldn't tell uh, the colour of it from smoke inhalation. So you don't have to have someone burnt for them to die and death and injuries from fire in 921 covers all of those exigencies. And explosions, uh, different types of explosives, exploding atmospheres, uh, types and characteristics and dynamics. And that's what happens in a caravan when LP gas builds up enough to explode. We had great fun up in uh, Brisbane with the uh, Queensland chapter blowing things up like that. Filled it up with LP gas and then they remotely ignited it, uh, blew that up, blew up a couple of buildings uh, and a car um, just to show you the results. So being an investigator can be fun. Uh, motor vehicles and transport and marine fires um, covers all, all of that. Uh, marine fires is fairly new. It's only been in there since, um, since about 2011, I think. Something that's um, becoming increasingly uh, important to us. A lot more boat fires around the place. Um, I've been involved in, in a couple. Um, some of the students say, well, I live out in the middle of the outback. Um, I'm not going to have a boat fire. Say, well, have you got a lake somewhere that, where people go boating? Yeah, well, you know, there's boats. Wildfire. Uh, there's a, a section on wildfire. Uh, Richard Woods and myself were involved in uh, that uh, section. Management of complex incidents, cause and responsibility analysis, reference publications, and official definitions. And 921 is the ultimate education tool for the fire investigator. There isn't anything else that covers as much as 921 does about fire investigation. And as I've just gone through all of those sections that cover uh, all of that.